My guest today is James Corbett of The Corbett Report. The Corbett Report is an independent, listener-supported, alternative news source. It operates on the principle of open-source intelligence and provides podcasts, interviews, articles, and videos about breaking news and important issues from 9-11 truth and false flag terror to the Big Brother police state, eugenics, geopolitics, the central banking fraud, and more. The Corbett Report is edited, webmastered, written, produced, and hosted by James Corbett. James Corbett, welcome to the Vin Armani Show. Thank you so much for having me on. It's a pleasure to be here. So you are over in Japan. And for those people who are not aware of you, which is probably with our audience and particularly the people uh, watching this on Activist Post Facebook, that's probably next to nobody. But for the very few who uh, who are not aware of you, I would suggest everybody go and, and check out the Corbett Report as soon as you can, but leave several hours because once you start down the rabbit hole, there's, <laughs> there's a lot there. Great content. One thing that I wanted to start out with is talking with you about – uh, the open source intelligence means because you, your content is very well researched and very well put together. What made you decide to to take this approach and uh, and talk to us about a little bit about how it works? Well, at the time that I started coming together with the idea for a website, uh, it was uh, something that I'd never really contemplated before. But at that particular time, back in late 2006, I was starting to encounter all this incredible, crazy information about all this uh, Operation Northwoods and the founding of the Federal Reserve and all of this kind of information that was just blowing my mind. And I knew I had to get out there and try to put, my, put some of that information out there uh, in my own way. And for whatever reason, it just occurred to me that I saw so many different podcasts and things that were doing this type of work, but were doing it in a way that I thought wasn't reflective of the reality of the internet mm. and wasn't really taking advantage of the incredible opportunity that we have with this communications technology. Namely, that uh, there were a lot of um, shows where people would talk about this or that document, but then you'd have to go and, I guess, search for it yourself in order to find it. Oh, I thought, what's the point of that? We're on the internet. I can just link people directly to the source documents of whatever I'm talking about. So from the very, even before the founding of the website, I knew that I was going to make a podcast and it was going to uh, have a documentation list. Everything that I talk about, any video, any uh, audio, any article, I would just link people directly to it so they could go to the actual source document that I was talking about, because that's the beauty of the internet. And uh, that isn't really a revolutionary idea, but it kind of was at the time. And so that was really the genesis of it. And that was coming together at the same time as I was reading um, about the CIA's open source intelligence unit, where mm. they, they, they were talking openly a decade plus ago about the fact that in this day and age, the vast majority of the information that they really need, they can collect through open source channels. So you can find it in newspapers and magazines and television shows and all sorts of archived material that's readily available on the internet. Mm. And I thought, hey, you know, I mean, if it's good enough for this spies <laughs> and spooks, it's good enough for me. For sure, for sure. So speaking of uh, spies and, and spooks, one of the interesting things that's that's happened that both we at Activist Post and you there at the Corbett Report have shared and something that I wanted to get into today because I, I think that you're probably the best person to, to talk about this with is the rise of fake news. But particularly what I wanted to get at, which uh, you covered uh, on your show, but it was something that we were dealing with as well, was particularly this prop or not Russian propaganda site that popped up. There was a kind of a short list of these people who were supposed to be these crazy major uh, disseminators of Russian propaganda. Activist Post was on that list. That's not really surprising to me. I think it's it's one of those targets that's out there. But you wound up on this list, and that surprised me quite a bit. I'm I'm interested to know now. You know. We're, we're weeks later where it seems well into this narrative arc about this Russian propaganda thing. What what do you think it was that you were covering that put you on the radar? Because you cover so many things. What was it do you think that you covered that put you particularly on the radar on this Russian propaganda fake fakery? 
Well, I can only speculate, but I think one of the common denominators amongst many of the people on that list that really does range from left-wing type of uh, uh, outlets to right-wing to libertarian and all sorts of other um, uh, alternative media outlets, I think the common denominator uh, for a lot of them is a staunch anti-NATO, anti-military aggression stance. And I think certainly I, if that's the charge, then I'm definitely guilty of it. I've talked at great length about NATO. And uh, in fact, I think the example of Russian propaganda that they provided on that proper not list was the fact that I dared to say that NATO was the greatest threat to peace on the planet at one point. So so apparently that is enough to get you labeled as Russian propaganda because anything that uh, that anyone that so much as questions the NATO military agenda around the world or the creation of this overarching, encompassing global military alliance uh, clearly must be working for Putin. So yeah, let's. I wanted to talk about this uh, a little bit and and dig into it. I have been mystified, uh, and there's just been this nagging question in my mind, and I have not really been able to answer um, why right now. I mean, I remember being a child growing up, and the the specter of the Soviet menace of uh, the global thermonuclear war. I mean, I remember waking up in in you know from having nightmares about this as a kid. It was pumped into our brains. And then it felt like, you know, the 90s, the wall fell, Russia kind of fell into the background. And then obviously, starting in 2001, we know exactly who the new boogeyman became. Why do you think that we are seeing this rise again of Russia as a boogeyman, even though it's a clearly a capitalist Russia, it's a Russia that's very close to us culturally? Why now do you think? There are a number of different things that feed into that, but I think we have to see that the reason that I think it's kicked into 11 over right. the past uh, couple of w weeks or a couple of months anyway is uh, partly out of a frustration because there was a narrative arc that was being built up that was gradually bringing Russia into the picture as a boogeyman. And uh, it's not difficult to identify who was pushing that narrative. It was clearly the the neocons, uh, who basically, uh, for people who don't know, of course, the project for New American Century was the, uh, the original home base of the neocons uh, that obviously led into the Bush administration. But uh, they just had a facelift uh, in the latter part of the last decade and became the Foreign Policy Initiative, co-founded by Bill Kristol and Robert Kagan and Dan Senior, aka Neocon Central. And if you go to their mission statement on their website, they say that, I mean, it's it's the exact same things as they used to talk about with uh, uh, the Project for New American Century. They want a 21st century of global domination of the American empire. Um, I don't think they use quite that phrase, but that's <laughs> essentially what they say. And they identify Russia and China as two of the main threats to that. And uh, so they've been talking about this for years and have been pumping it through various um, mouthpieces, including, of course, Kagan, but also uh, his wife, uh, Victoria Newland, a.k.a. F. the E.U. Newland, who Christ. was caught on that uh, tape even before the engineered Maidan Square um, <clears throat> uh, revolution in Ukraine uh, was finished. They were already talking about who the, uh, the Americans and the neocons really wanted in place in their puppet regime there in Ukraine. Um, and you have people like James Kerchick and others who are associated with the, the Foreign Policy Initiative, I believe it's called, um, who uh, goes, for example, he was part of that staged Liz Wall uh, resigning from RT because she suddenly right. discovered that the R in RT stood for Russia and she was shocked, <laughs> shocked to find that there was, this was a Russian state owned broadcaster that she was working for. Uh, all of that kind of stuff ha has been building up for a long time. And then I think it was quite obvious that these exact same people, including Robert Kagan were on record saying that they were anti-Trump. They were, they were wanted Hillary in, um, they were talking about, uh, you can even read Robert Kagan's interviews that he was giving uh, in last summer, talking about the lead up to this uh, presidential selection cycle, where he was saying Obama uh, didn't want to go in and really arm Ukraine properly because he's afraid of a nuclear con confrontation with Russia, uh, and then rolling his eyes and saying, but Hillary understands it and Hillary wants, uh, you know, to, to have a strong Ukraine and things like this. So, and he was saying specifically that myself and others in our, in my foreign policy circles will be voting for Hillary. Um, well, Hillary didn't get in. Um, so I think that the frustration of that narrative is coming to the fore with, um, 
uh, with the Trump administration, which I certainly don't think is hope and change and right. hallelujah. Right. But I think it is a different inflection on this. I think that China is going to be more of the target under Trump. At least mm. that's all the signals that we're getting, plus all of the appointments that he's making, including a chief um, economic advisor who has written entire books about, you know, the uh, China and China is the biggest threat to the United States and things like this. So I think definitely China is going to be more of the target. Um, and that complicates or, or problematizes the little narrative that they were trying to, to form there, which was that um, essentially, I mean, if Russia is the boogeyman and China is also kind of a lesser boogeyman, then ultimately what that does is drive Russia and China together in ways that they normally wouldn't. Uh, they don't, they haven't had uh, enjoyed very close relations for decades and decades. They've had very tense relations for a very long time, but that is thawing um, because Russia and China have both clearly been in NATO's crosshairs for the, the past several years. So now they're doing things like that massive uh, Gazprom Beijing mm -hmm. gas deal to, mm -hmm. uh, to send a pipeline down into uh, down into China with 38 billion cubic meters of uh, Russian gas every year. That's a significant development. And those types of developments are coming at a faster and faster pace now. And I think that was part of the, the overall game plan here was to create, really create and engineer that system of NATO aggression and Russia and China on the, on the backside. And I think that's been frustrated. And so it's going to be very interesting to see the way that this develops over the next few years. And I, I don't think this means they're going to let up on the idea. I think they're, that's why we're seeing the increase in, if anything, in terms of the boogie, boogeymanization of Russia. So, uh, you know, during the first Cold War, and perhaps that we might end up in a few years calling this the second Cold War, it, it seems that we might be approaching, there was definitely this idea, whether it was true or false but it was it was certainly a, a rush for empire an ever increasing empire with ideology on top of it this one ideology versus the other one now though it seems like the ideological differences particularly i mean if you're talking about economic ideology there really doesn't seem to be any difference that you can, i mean you're we're not going to have a sort of McCarthy about communism and this there's really nothing to draw on that when you're talking about uh, uh, Russia and the U.S. And it seems like the way that we're going about empire is very different. But what is this struggle fundamentally about? I think we could see some things with China that have uh, some different economic aspects. But I mean, as you were discussing with the with the oil, with the gas is fundamentally, is that what this is about? Is this a, is this about control of oil and gas in Eurasia or is there something more that we're missing here? Well, fundamentally, I think that this is ultimately about the same old quest that has been the quest of every would-be dictator throughout the entire entirety of human history, which is global domination, global government. And the uh, question is, who gets to be in charge of that global government system? And I think this is about the creation of the the big the big confrontation that makes the ultimate emergence of that global governmental system inevitable. Um, I've always posited it as a type of thesis antith antithesis that will emerge in the synthesis of global government one way or another, no matter which side of that thesis or antithesis is stronger. Um, and I've talked about this a number of times uh, in, in recent years on my website in articles like uh, The Great Decoupling, How the West is Engineering Its Own Downfall, and talking about uh, China and the U.S. frenemies with benefits. Uh, the idea is that when you look at the uh, the, the the type of uh, confrontation that's being set up, in fact, similar to the Cold War, which was a largely staged, stage managed uh, uh, piece of political theater sure. that worked quite well for the would be dictators and warmongers and uh, and war profiteers of uh, certainly in the West and their counterparts in on the eastern side of the uh, the Iron Curtain. I think that this is also a, a something of a stage managed uh, a, a confrontation of sorts where exactly as you say, it's not it's not like there is some sort of huge ideological divide going on here. When you look, for example, at Russia uh, creating the Eurasian Economic Union um, between some of its neighboring states, which has been explicitly modeled on the European Union, including a, a an economic uh, Euro Eurasian Economic Commission that was explicitly modeled on the European Commission and other things like that, that they're trying to create a currency block. Uh, they're trying to create this this type of 
uh, what starts out as trade deals exactly the way the the uh, the uh, European Union started out essentially as a trade deal and creating closer and closer ties. So it's that exact same type of regional block creating a, 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 a type of I mean, a non-democratic, I, I don't care about democracy per se, but right. you understand the idea that people have absolutely no say whatsoever right. in anything that's going on here. Um, and Or you look at China, and uh, the the types of uh, things that they're involved in are, uh, again, on uh, just a mirror image of what's going on in on the West. And you can look at a lot of the, uh, the business connections that go on at the absolute top levels that were part of the, the entire story of the opening up of China. It wasn't Nixon that went to China. It was Kissinger who preceded him, who was, of course, doing the groundwork for Rockefeller. And um, and you can see those ties, uh, and I've documented them. I have an, a podcast episode on China and the New World Order. So I think when you start to see the various ways that China and Russia and the BRICS countries and all of these supposed counter-institutions are really advocating for and becoming a part of the global governmental system. China advocating for the IMF special drawing rights to become the world mm-hmm. reserve currency. They've been on record for years advocating for that. Uh, the creation of, of the BRICS as some sort of political institution as a counterbalance to NATO and the Western institutions, but really it's the, it's the same fundamental idea and ideology. And the only question, I guess, would be, well, who comes out on top of that when you create these regional blocks and these regional mm-hmm. governmental systems? Mm-hmm. And in the end, I don't really care. It doesn't really matter to me whether it's, you know, a Russian face on or a Chinese face on, on top of that or an American face. It's still what I think we are should be against anyway, which is centralization of control and creation of regional government as a stepping stone to global government. I hear you describing a scenario that sounds so close to what Orwell described in 1984 of these sort of three super states. Uh, and it's just, I mean, the fact that it is Eurasia, East Asia, and Oceania, right, which NATO, you know, you could say, you know, that we're talking about an ocean there. So, or is. However, in 1984, it did seem as though there were there were three separate entities. But what I see you describing to me is more of a situation where the sort of any differences that we might see are not actually real, and that there's there's sort of three branches of the same entity. Is that essentially what you're what you're saying here? Well, actually, even 1984 is more subtle than that, because there was the bombs that would rain down on them from time to time, sure. and they would be told, oh, this is Eurasia, or they would sure. be told it's East Asia, or whoever they're at war at war with this week. But the implication was there that it could be the government doing it to themselves exactly. and just blaming it on the enemy, which, again, is exceptionally perceptive and uh, probably much closer to the truth than than uh, most people would like to admit. And I think similarly, when we look at the, the real world situation playing out today, I, I, again, I, I think there are different factions and they really do struggle with each other and they really do want to be on top of the dog pile, but they all want the dog pile. They all want that system in place. It's just who's going to have the upper hand in that. So again, whether it is really truly different competing blocks or blocks that coordinate with each other and and are on the same team, it amounts to the same thing. And I do think that, I mean, I I think global government in the sense of some, you know, god emperor of the the world ruling over this system that's completely controlled uh, may may never happen. Um, If it does, I think it's still a very long way off. I think that you have to have the regional governmental system in place first. And in that regional system, again, there could be genuine struggle between different regions, or it could be stage managed. I think probably a little bit of both. Again, not, I mean, look at any power structure, and it's not a monolithic thing that is all 100% controlled from one one central position. There are different players at different levels and with different uh, powers working in different ways with different people and coordinating across across lines of nation states or whatever the way that people think the world is organized, it isn't really organized that way. So, I mean, you may have a Rockefeller clique that's coordinating with certain 
cliques in China and certain cliques in the uh, in Russia and things like this, but um, those cliques may be fighting with other cliques that again span different lines. So I think it's much more complicated than a simple, straightforward narrative. But again, I think every player at the table ultimately wants a system where they have as much control as possible. And even if that, again, amounts to just having control over this region of the globe and that region of the globe, it still amounts to a system where ultimately you're going to get uh, more and more centralization of power and control in fewer and fewer hands. So I want to talk about this uh this analogy because i have been thinking of that that rocket bomb analogy i have been thinking about that with this russian this recent the russian hacking allegations which i i really think most people don't believe i mean the the polls say most people don't believe it i think most of even the mainstream media is having a very difficult time definitively saying yes the russians absolutely hacked even though they're they're pushing the narrative uh, and yes, but yesterday the the uh, Defense Authorization Act got signed by Obama, and it looks like there's some anti propaganda measures that look a lot like setting up some COINTEL Pro types of things. I'm I'm really interested to know because it seems a it seems like there are so many more moving parts to picking Russia as the boogeyman than there was with. Islamic terrorism. Islamic terrorism seems so easy. It, I mean, the shock that would happen with every terrorist attack all around the Western world was just it was it was great. I mean, for the, for those people who were trying to lead people into a, more of a surveillance state and more authoritarianism, there seemed like there are so many moving parts with this Russian hacking thing. Where do, where do you think that they're trying to go in the short term with this uh, Russian hacking, Russian tampering, Russian propaganda narrative? Where do you think they're trying to go? Uh, well, I mean, that's a good point. Um, certainly the Islamic terror uh, uh, idea was quite convenient to the would-be rulers and quite convenient to everyone. Um, again, I mean, Putin uh, benefits from it because, of course, he's fighting the terrorist threat from Chechnya and things like this. Every power structure in the world loved the idea of terrorism as the boogeyman of the 21st century because everyone could point to whoever dissents from them as you're the terrorists and we got to crack down on you. So... I certainly do see that as a very convenient narrative, but at the same time, it doesn't create the world-changing, world-epoch type of uh, situation where it's very difficult to, I mean, even though they tried, and they tried very concertedly, it's very difficult to convince the entire world that they should be scared of a few turban boogeymen hiding under their beds, mm, um, mm. when really, I mean... As as has been pointed out ad nauseum over the past decade and a half, as an American, you're more likely to be killed by a bee sting than by a terrorist and things like right. this. Um, so it has created – it moved the football very far down the field, but I don't think it's going to score the, the end goal uh, touchdown that they want. So you ultimately have to um, – yeah, bring in other se sectors of the globe. And that has, it, it, again, it's it's a kind of lack of imagination, I think, on the part of the would-be rulers, because, hey, it worked in the 20th century, let's do it in the 21st century. And on that note, I mean, I see so many parallels that have developed between the World War I lead-up and what we're seeing right now, mm. that, again, I think there must be some some at least recognition of those kinds of parallels that back in world war one, of course, the rising power that was threatening UK world hegemon was uh, Germany. And you saw the, the types of arming and building up and creation of the narrative that would lead to world war one in, in that era. And I think we're seeing a similar thing with China ultimately. And I think China is, it, I think that really ultimately China is going to be the, the bigger target moving on in the 21st century. But right now, I think Russia is just the convenient, well, it's a big nuclear power, and we've been at war with them before, so, or cold war with them before, so why don't we keep that going? And again, it is a lack of imagination, but if it works, why not use it? It's like false flag terrorism. If it works, just use it over and over and over and over and over and over until you achieve your objectives. So, I... I this is this is a very this is a very good point that you're making about how difficult it is and it has been to make the entire world scared of being hurt by Islamic terrorism. But it makes me wonder 
Because at this point, I really don't see the average American, the average European being particularly frightened of either Russia or China. And I wonder what you think if, – if this is a reimagining or a, a remix as it were, if this is a remix and we're about to go back to say the 50s, 60s, 70s and 80s, there was a real fear of mutually assured destruction, of nuclear war. That was real. It was palpable. It was deep in the bones of every person on the planet, and it made people move in ways that they maybe have never moved before. Are we about to see something on that level, a fear on that level? Is mutual assured destruction about to come back into the mix? Well, as ridiculous as it seems, I'm sure to you and to me and to many other people, there are people who at the very least are finding it politically convenient to buy into this narrative. So you'll notice that suddenly Democrats in the United States are all on board with this and Russia is the big threat to the world world peace. And oh, how much worse is it now that Trump's in charge of the nuclear arsenal? It's guaranteed to be nuclear conflagration. We're all going to die. And I see a lot of that that I think really is in earnest that's being pumped out um, on the left side of the phony left-right paradigm right now. And there, there is a home for that type of thinking within the traditional right, and the neoconservatives being an obvious example of that. They've been pumping that fire and brimstone from Russia for years and years now, so they are feeling vindicated. It's really only these darn pesky people who aren't buying into the narrative who voted for Trump and, you know, don't don't want to be part of this, that that somehow or other they're falling through the cracks. Um, but I think a large part, portion of the population is ready to go along with it. And I mean, the, the, the absurdity of it is, and the inversion of what's going on right now, really, I mean, I've known for a long time that people will do twist themselves into whatever pretzel knots are necessary in order to maintain their political paradigm. But it's really coming to the fore right now where you see things like Politico coming out and talking about that Trump, close Trump advisor, Henry Kissinger, has mm -hmm. a lot of close ties to Russia, guys. <laughs> He's a Russian agent, which is so... Utterly Crazy. bizarre, Crazy. because of course he's been associated with mm -hmm. every single politician for the past 50 mm -hmm. years, including, of course, Hillary, who name-checked him during the campaign, saying mm -hmm. uh, she, he was her mentor and all of that kind of nonsense. At the time, of course, not a peep. E everyone just treated it like, oh, that's just bit politics as usual. But now Kissinger is some sort of Russian agent because he talks to Trump? I mean, to be fair, yes. I mean, Kissinger and Putin are personal friends, and they invite each other over for dinner, and they, they certainly are uh, uh, collaborators, and I think that's part of the, that nexus of the uh, the different systems, and and shows the uh, the, the way that they're, the competing power blocks idea isn't quite what it appears to be. But it's so bizarre now that the certainly left wing uh, media outlets are pointing this out because it's convenient for this particular narrative, or the idea of Russia hacking the election. What right. does that even mean? What does that mean? Are they talking about uh, hacking, by which we mean spear phishing, uh, Podesta? Or are they talking about hacking the DNC, which all signs seem to indicate was a leak yes. from the inside rather than a hack? Or are they talking about hacking the voting booths themselves? Or are they saying that somehow something about this made people actually change their vote. I mean, do you think if you would go to people who voted, say, voted for Trump or voted for St uh, uh, Jill Stein or, or uh, Gary Johnson and said, you know, did, did, did Russia and did this hacking hacking change your v viewpoint? Would you have voted for Hillary otherwise? How many people do you think, yep, I would have voted for Hillary. It was only because of this. I mean, it's, it's just such a stupid narrative. But again, people are twisting themselves into the pretzel knots that are necessary to make themselves believe it because it is their political paradigm. And it's not very easy to crack through those walls. Yeah, this, this Russian hacking narrative, I... In the past several days, what's really been going through my mind on it, and you, you touched on it there, is that it is almost – because it, they, we are definitely talking about if they really want to say that this is Russian hacking and they really want to say it's directed by the Russian government, we are talking about a military attack. That's, that's It's a military attack that they're talking about. And – it appears to me that this is – and you have covered many, many false flags and questionable international incidents over the years. 
This appears to me to be a false flag that successfully got legislation pushed past that n- that not just was staged or not some other incident, but that actually never happened. I mean, it, can you – is there another example? I, do, I don't – I mean, I don't have enough background, but is there some other example in history that you have found that where you have a situation of a false flag that actually did not happen? Well, I mean, there are a number of things you could point to, one of which would be the Gulf of Tonkin, the uh, the, the second incident with the USS Maddox, where it the, it's now pretty much uh, conclusive that it was never attacked that second time. Interesting. But okay. That, that attack that didn't happen was the, the right. at least the, the proximate uh, cause of the Vietnam War. So uh, it certainly does happen. And, uh, and I, I think that that risk of that type of event only increases from here because we are entering the age of virtual flag terror, where it, it, uh, let's imagine that, uh, you know, the terrorists or Russia or China or whoever hacks into the uh, the, the electrical grid or the you know, mm-hmm. nuclear power plant or something and causes some sort of major disaster in the United States. What's, I mean, how, what on earth can the average person do other than take the word of the authority figures that, yeah, okay, this server was hacked and it was hacked by Russia. We don't have access to the server logs. We don't have any access to any data, any physical evidence whatsoever that anyone can even uh, touch or hold or or do anything with. I mean, with 9-11, at least it was out there in the open and people could see what was happening to uh, in terms of the physical destruction that was taking place and see that it didn't add up. But when it comes to virtual flag terror, again, there's just absolutely nothing. Um, all you can do is take at face value what is being told to you or not take it at face value. But uh, you don't have any evidence that you can actually dig dig your uh, fingers into and this is a perfect example of that because again we're, we're being told oh there, there's there's fingerprints and hallmarks of mm. russian hackers in in the hacking of the dnc or whatever but really what are those and how do we know from the outside we're just being told this um and so it really is a question of do you believe your government if so then you've just got to believe that what they're telling you is is the truth so whether or not it was hacking that got Trump into the White House, he's, he's going to be moving on in here in a in a few weeks. And as you said, it did kind of throw a monkey wrench into what I think everybody had assumed that Hillary was uh, getting in, everybody as far as we know. And certainly on the neocon side, they they had spent years ramping up this whole play and it it fell apart. You've done a yeoman's job of, uh, of documenting that over the years. It's pretty, pretty amazing as you go back through. Uh, you, know, you pretty much called this all the way as it moved through. But now we have Trump. He started to make some, some cabinet appointments. You obviously can't believe what anybody says during their campaign. You've ran across some of these names of some of these cabinet appointments over the years. As you sort of look at what he, the, the team that he's putting together – what sticks out in your mind that we can expect uh, during this next one, two, three, four years of Trump? Where, what do you see happening? Well, I have talked um, to, if, for example, Michael Krieger of Liberty Blitzkrieg uh, about uh, his appointment of Steve Mnuch- Mnuchin as the Treasury Secretary and all of the ominous things that that entails. And I think we see from the financial side of it, uh, he is surrounding himself with billionaires and people who have been and are highly connected into the, the same banksters that ran the uh, the 2008 uh, scam and the bailouts and all of that. So I think we're going to see a lot of not just business as usual, but maybe business on steroids from the, the financial side of it. And as I say, I think probably the uh, it, it, all signs seem to point towards China being the boogeyman for the Trump administration in the way that uh, the neocons and others were planning on Russia being the boogeyman. And uh, again, as an example of that, uh, we have um, Peter Navarro, the Harvard-trained economist and one-time day trader, uh, who has been appointed uh, to uh, run the National Trade Council in the Trump administration. And he is the author of books like Death by China (laughs) and Crouching Tiger, What China's Militarism Means for the World. Again, picks like that definitely portend what is likely to become very quickly a trade war. And from that point, you never know, maybe something more literally a war. And on that note, I think it was interesting, the recent 
theft of the U.S. naval drone mm -hmm. um, from disputed waters in the South China Sea um, and all of that. I, again, on on the surface, that's not a very important story, and it will uh, undoubtedly be sort of brushed away and forgotten. But I think what it portends for what is coming, especially in the South China Sea, where I think a lot of this could become an actual military confrontation at some point, I think it's uh, it's pretty ominous. So I think that's that's more of the direction that I'm looking in, and I think I'd like to think that this hysteria about Russia will subside as the Trump administration moves on and ultimately Hillary, I hope, <laughs> has to fade into the background. But again, that is only hope at this point because, of course, we know that the Clintons and the, the, uh, the, the parasites that surround them um, have a strange way of ma maintaining uh, their infestation in the American body politic. But we'll see. Again, it might, be, it might be finally over. It might be the end of that particular era. And it doesn't mean that it's all sunshine, puppy dogs, and rainbows. But uh, at any rate, it's going to be a different story, I think, than what, the, what was being planned. <laughs> absolutely fascinating stuff i mean you've you've opened my mind now i certainly hope that this russia thing falls off but we will watch china we will certainly be uh paying attention to the things that you're doing at corporate report because it seems that you are constantly the first and on top with the the most in-depth coverage of of what's going on both now and and in the past and what's leading up to where we're at right now James Corbett, I want to thank you so very much, and uh, I hope that we can have you back on again soon to discuss uh, you know, further developments. Anytime you need me, I'd be happy to be here. Thanks for having me on, Vin. Thank you, thank you so much, James, and we'll see you soon.